Welcome back to the Houndsman XP podcast. We are coming at you, as Steve says, alive on this Friday morning. Uh, you probably won't hear this for a, a week or two, but uh, uh, my co-host Steve Fielder is on the other end of this line with our special guest today, Randy Smith. So, Steve, how are you this morning? I'm just doing great, Chris. Life couldn't be better. Just enjoying the sunshine down here. But secretly, I'm on a trout stream in, um, in North Carolina in my mind, I guess. But uh, uh, but just glad to be alive and glad to be on the Houndsman XP podcast and especially excited about our guest today. Well, I can tell you that the uh, pollen is definitely in the air, the spring bloom here in uh, Indiana. Um, we've been dealing with some uh, drainage issues the last few days, and we're not talking about creek drainages, we're talking about in our throats. So we're coughing and clearing our throats and, and different stuff like that. So we will muscle through this thing, but we've got our signals down now. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Everything's everything's good to go. Uh, I think I have my uh, uh, my signals here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm yeah. I'm getting to be a real techie on this stuff. You know. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Well, Steve, yeah, I'm going to really? tell you what. I am going to. I'm just going to tee this up here uh, for you, because our our guest Randy Smith is uh, somebody that you've developed a relationship with. And I'm going to let you just pile right on this thing. So go for it. Oh, well, yeah, Chris. I, I'm especially excited today about our podcast because uh, back in 2016, I was privileged to go up to Greencastle, Indiana at the request of UKC to judge the bench show up there at the World Championship. And um, Alan... Gingrich uh, with UKC asked me to bring my boots and lights that he could use a judge on Thursday night, which I did. I went out and judged the cast of dogs. And then on Friday night, they have a custom of asking the old timers <laughs> to go out and uh, sit at the trucks with the backup handlers as the dogs advance. The event's getting more uh, serious at that point, And they want the judges to, to, uh, be able to concentrate on the four handlers and four hounds. So I was privileged to go out and, and uh, sit and listen to uh, Randy Smith's uh, Biffy Sue female, uh, and she won the cast that, that night and then uh, ultimately won the world championship in 2016. And at that event, I, I was privileged to meet Randy for the first time. I'd heard about him. Uh, through our mutual friend Terry Walker, who fishes with him, and uh, and and I also met Randy's uh, partner Tom Strang, who is a just a terrific guy. And uh, one thing led to the other, and then when I decided I was going to try to see if I could train one more puppy in my lifetime, I know that sounds a little morbid. I'm I'm not exactly as my mother says, one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, I realized that the hills were getting steeper and the swamps deeper, but anyway, um, I talked to Randy and Randy informed me about a litter of puppies that he had coming. And, uh, one thing led to the other and, and man, uh, he picked up a nice pup, uh, picked out a nice pup for me that I've really enjoyed. And so our relationship has grown around the, the dogs. I was privileged to do a an article for American Cooner magazine about Randy's uh, Lone Pine Kennel and his experience with the tree and walker dogs over the years. And and then here we are with the podcast and I'm we're, you know, looking to uh, talk to breeders and talk to people that are deeply involved in the hound sport. And um, I just think Randy's going to be a great guest. And Randy, it's, it's really good to have you aboard with us today. And uh, I'm going to let Chris uh, lead the, the interviewing process of this thing, but I just couldn't be happier that you're with us. Well, thank you. I'm a real privilege to be here. Well, Randy, uh, we tried to record this podcast one other time, and we had some really good content. Uh, 
and uh, the elements and the conditions weren't the best. I was trying to record off of uh, uh, my recorder and in the middle of a, a rainstorm while sitting in my truck on Bluetooth. So it sounds like we're going through a hailstorm. So I'm glad that you agreed, and I'm ha- I'm really grateful that you agreed to uh, take some time out of your busy schedule to come back on the podcast and and. One of the things that Steve always says about you and the way he describes you is that you are extreme um, in everything you do, whether it's your coyote trapping, your business, your family life, and your hounds. And and Houndsman XP is all about finding extreme performance in our hounds and our houndsmen. So um, I really would like for just our our audience to hear who Randy Smith is, where you're from, uh, and just give us some background on yourself there, Randy. All right. I I was born and raised on a family dairy farm on the, the side of the hill here in uh, western Pennsylvania. And uh, oh, we just grew up in the outdoors. We had, you know, limited means, and that was uh, my my out for entertainment was anything with a trap gun or fishing pole, and I've just been – obsessed with being an outdoorsman my whole life so that was that was my beginnings i mean i i uh i started out uh having a a real love and desire for trapping and and uh that that led to me getting into the hound sport by just being a a fur nut so to speak so (laughs) that's how i got started coon hunting and about what age were you when you started coon hunting uh, I was a junior in high school whenever I bought my first dog from a, a classmate there. He had a blue tick female that was, I think at the time she was six, six years old. And I paid a hundred dollars for her a little bit at a time <laughs> till I got him <laughs> paid off. And, uh, <laughs> that was, that was my, uh, humble beginnings. You know, that seems to be a common thread among, among, uh, beginning houndsman that we've talked to so far i know it's my story the first the first uh great hound i purchased was a uh a payment plan option so uh mm-hmm. you know it's, it just seems like when you get the bug you'll do what you've got to do to be able to be engaged in the sport and follow these hounds and and uh sounds like that it's a it's a common story among among extreme extreme houndsmen so um so what about today where you, where are you at today and and uh, what do you do for a living uh I, I built my wife and i built a our home on the family farm there and um i own a pest control business we have uh give or take it at a minimum of like six employees normally through the through the spring summer and early fall months and then we're we're pretty much done through the winter time so mm-hmm. that but uh it's good for an outdoorsman you know to be you know have almost half the year off so that's yeah that's good but we don't we don't look at it as time off i still you know try to hit it as hard as i can every day whether we're, we're working here i mean i i tell people that you know, I work really hard at what I'm doing, whether it makes any sense or not. <laughs> well, before we dive into those Lone Pine Hounds, Randy, um, mm-hmm. you know, winter time, you talk about, um, you know, being an outdoorsman. So what other types of things do you, do you pursue or other types of outdoor sports do you engage in? No, I'm still, uh, I still trap, you know, through the winter months, take take trips to anywhere from Maryland to the Midwest to Georgia to Louisiana. Um, uh, I've trapped in a bunch of different states, but those are the most common ones I've been to here in recent years, either trapping coyotes or red fox or otters and bobcats in the south there. And uh, I've done live market trapping and fun trapping and trapping for hair and, you know, anything I could do to make a buck. Does your uh, pest control business include nuisance and uh, wildlife control, or is it just uh, bugs yes, and such? It, it does. Yeah, no, it's it's insects and wildlife and bat work and all encompassing. You know, if people call here with a pest related issue. We've 
we can pretty much handle it. You know, one of the things that I dealt with for years and years as a conservation officer is is nuisance wildlife calls, and and uh, I would tell people that you know my job was law enforcement; it wasn't pest control. You know, in a way that was where I was trying to help them. So I, we we constantly referred people to uh, nuisance wildlife trappers that that we had licensed and and ready to roll to go out and, and help these people. So. Uh, that part right. of that part of the job is uh, something I'm pretty familiar with. Yes, yeah. We, uh, the lion's share of our business is insect work anymore. The, um, they've they've licensed a lot of nuisance control trappers now in Pennsylvania, and it's made it so that uh, there's a lot of people doing it, so there's less work for each of us, but. It, you know, we just take it as it comes, whatever. But we do, we do quite a few bat exclusion jobs through the summer and skunk work in the spring and in the summer when they're tearing people's lawns up and things of that, things like that. But uh, the other thing that I really enjoy doing is, uh, Steve already mentioned that Terry Walker and I, and lately another friend of mine, Gail Preston, have been going to Canada fishing for all the last several years and I found a spot in the Northwest territory that has ruined me for all other kinds of fishing. It's a Northern pike, uh, heaven, so to speak, if you like to pike fish. And so that's that week or week or two of going up there each summer is something that I think about daily. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's something I really enjoy doing too. But, uh, Randy, if uh, I can just, jump, like, if I can jump in there yeah. just a minute, buddy. Uh, <laughs> we're this is the Extreme Performance Podcast, and uh, t- tell uh, Chris and our audience a little bit about that last trip that you guys had up there and the temperature and etc. <laughs> well, I I went to uh, Great Slave Lake in July with Gail Preston. Uh, Terry Walker couldn't go and. So he was upset that he missed a trip. So Terry and I, uh, more so me, I guess, decided to go again in September. And uh, when we flew in, I think it was the uh, second week, we're still in the single digits of September, like the 7th or something like that. We flew in. We had to fly in uh, right off of the water. It was such a snowstorm going on there and it it didn't get any better the whole week it was in the teens in the morning and uh it was brutal fishing from all daylight till practically dark every day (laughs) steve (laughs) Steve. some people as i under some people as i understood stand stayed at camp but there were the the Uh, extreme ones that stayed out there from daylight (laughs) till dark yeah, explain, yeah, it, not, d- describe what how Terry Walker, that. yeah, dis- Steve, describe how Terry Walker uh, described Randy fishing. That was funny. How I, he said he's an animal. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he said the guy never well, quits. <laughs> I, I figure when I'm up there, that's what I went for, so I'm going to fish from, in the summertime, uh, it really never gets dark there whenever we're there so we start fishing uh pretty early in the morning and we, it, it when it gets turns that it's no more than dusk all night but when it gets to that point is about 11 o'clock at night and we fish from you know practically daylight in the morning till 11 o'clock at night yeah so 23 hours sure. at 23 hours of fishing <laughs> a day i think that qualifies for extreme <laughs> don't you chris yeah yeah, no doubt. I, I tell I tell people when I start to see pink elephants swimming across the lake there in the evening, it's time to go back. Yeah, I'm su- <laughs> I'm surprised you don't move up there when it's dark, twenty three hours a day, so you can coon hunt. Yeah, well, I don't think the raccoon lives up there. <laughs> it's that's pretty pretty tough conditions up there most of the year. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, and in your it's spare a good time though. And in your spare time, you've got this little hobby where you develop world champions in uh, the Trim Walker Coonhound breed, and that's what we're here for today, Randy, is to talk about those Lone Pine Trim Walkers that that you've been breeding. So, uh, how many? 
just give us some back background on on Lone Pine and uh, that line of dogs you're okay, hunting up well, there. Just, yeah, one quick correction, you know, whenever people say, how did you or I, or the, that, that that's not involved in this whole long story. It's we. I've had so much help and support from, you know, too many people to mention, you know, besides Tom and Rick Strauser and, you know, John Brundage and Dale Montgomery. And, and uh, the list, you know, could go on and on about, guys that would drop everything they were doing and drive a female clean to Mississippi and turn around and drive straight back and in a rainstorm to and from, and, you know, just when, when Tom and I started breeding dogs, we, you know, we decided right from the beginning that even though we didn't have the funds that we would come up with them to try to use the best stud dogs or, you know, have the, have the best breeding stock that we could get. And so uh, I just want to make that clear that, that, you know, that I've had so much help and been blessed with such good friends and family. And, you know, my wife, Carrie, is she's a saint. So and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's, you yeah. know, I just wanted to say that, you know, because it's so many times people get caught up in I, me. You know, right, that's, right. That's, that's not what any of this well, that's, is about. That's yeah. very, very noble, Randy. And you know, I can't, I can't echo that enough. I mean, it's the most successful people I know are, are unselfish in this sport, and they're willing to help people, and um, you know, work as a team for a common goal. My wife's name is Carrie as well. I've been trying to talk her into uh, getting on a mic and doing a podcast with some of the wives. Uh, that may not be directly yeah. direct houndsmen, but they've definitely played a role in supporting casts. And I think it'd be a hoot listening to some of their stories and, and getting some of their thoughts. So yeah, getting some of their thoughts about why in the world are these guys doing this? Well, I've been uh, blessed to or fortunate to be in both of you guys' homes and meet the Carries. And they're both just delightful ladies and uh, mothers and. Uh, just uh, pretty ladies, of course, and uh, just uh, it's good to hear you mention them because they they really are supportive of you guys. I can tell that, and and I've been blessed in the same way. So good to hear. Yeah, yeah. So Randy, uh, you know, describe describe what got you started. You know that in in the trim walkers the the first dogs that you picked up on and and where you where you staked your claim in the in the coonhound sports and said this is what i want to build off this is where i want to go from here so you know how did you mm-hmm. how did you determine that and and what were those first dogs well the, I, I i said the first dog that i had was that old great blue tick female and uh at the time there were there were quite a few coon hunters around and uh, really nobody was much interested in, you know, going hunting with a young kid that had a, you know, a backtracking dog, you know. So <laughs> um, Joe Hartman took me in, and I I was in, in school with his daughter, and uh, we were dating a little bit, and I met Joe that way, and he was glad to take me. He wasn't worried about whether or not, you know, I would go back to his spots or none of that nonsense. You know, he was just glad to take a young kid coon hunting. And he he had a walker dog that he he caught hundreds of coons with. And, you know, at that time, you know, fur is what, you know, everything was about really. And About and, uh, about what years would that be, Randy, just, just so we know? That was 86, 87. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, We're, there were still, you know. It was before the crash of the fur market, and you yeah. know, it was everybody was catching coons. So I went with his old dog. His dog name was Bank, and he was today's standards. You know, would have been you know just like a pleasure dog or whatever. But he was a coon catching dog, and I seen right away that I wasn't wasn't hunting a very efficient coon hound. So I did get a, a dog out of Bank uh, from Walter Bush, another neighbor of mine here that's a coon hunter and and she turned out to be a great a great dog she was silent but deadly and and, uh the tragic story behind that at like three and a half years old she got shot off a tree here Mm. 
And so in the meantime, though, I started hunting with another guy that had, I think the, it, he was the best dog around, around by, by a long shot. And it was Claude Lawson with his dog, Lone River Gunner. And Lone River Gunner was a, a heavy lone pine bred dog. He was out of Logan's Quick and, and a female that, go, that uh, was out of uh, River Bend Flag and a lone pine female that went to Muddy Lanes Queen. And so my plan was to, was to breed that female that I had silk to, to Gunner, and it, it didn't happen because she got killed before I decided to do or had hmm. the chance to do that. So. So at that point, I was hooked on Lone Pine Dogs, and then uh, there was a man from Maryland named Gene Harrison that, that had heard about Gunner, and he persistently tried to get Claude to price him, and when Claude finally did, him and Woody Malone, that was from further out on the eastern shore, came up to try Gunner, and when I met those guys, that was that was the next chapter, you know, they were... Gene, Gene owned Findlay River Pete that uh, Stanley Duvall bred uh, Lone Pine Lady to several times. And so I was at the fountainhead of the Lone Pine Dogs in one meeting with those guys. And so yeah. that's where that's where it started. And I was I was hooked and I've never hunted a, you know, a dog after that that wasn't a Lone Pine Dog. Yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing story. Just how much... Uh... I guess what I'm I'm getting at here on this part is, you know, just your persistence to be involved in the hound sports puts you in the in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, we recently saw Jim Cannon at uh, MPHA Plot Days, and he he wrote an article one time for Plot Dogs Online called "Creating Your Own Luck." and talked about the importance of hard work and persistence. So, Steve, you wrote an article on River Bend Flag recently, didn't you? I did, for sure. I had a great visit with Kent Spencer. Uh, Kent, I believe, is 84 years old now, uh, still living down in eastern North Carolina. Um, isn't hunting as hard as he used to, of course, but his wife has uh, uh, had some illness. But Kent still gets out there at least once a week or more and and hunts his dogs and uh river bend flag was a tremendous influence on the walker breed back in the day and um and it's good to hear randy mention him because uh he was one of those dogs that people tended to uh they loved him or hated him you know uh he uh was known to produce some outstanding coon hounds sometimes people thought they were a little as we say in the Virginia is a little tight on the tree at times, but, um, yeah, a real, uh, influence on the Walker breed for sure. Randy, uh, what did you see in river bend flag? I mean, I hate to keep going. I'm not trying to come make this a river bend flag, but you obviously saw something no. there. Well, I mean, I just, I just knew what I saw whenever I had it with, you know, with Gunner and, and I owned, uh, grand sons and daughters of River Bend flag, you know, after that. And, you know, all I knew is this, you know, dog that could be in the back of the truck in a box that didn't even have an air hole in it. And he would strike, strike a cone out of the inside of that box going down the road at 35 mile an hour, like he was looking at it. And, uh, you know, I was just, you know, that, that dog there was, was, you know, what set the pattern for me in the future on, you know, a future goal for a cone dog. I mean, he was loud and big and an awesome reproducer. I, you know, my, my line goes back to him and, and it's a shame that he went sterile early because I had females that I would have loved to have bred to him that it, I didn't get to, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he was, he was, he would definitely leave an impression on you. Well, we, in our interview before uh, you, you had mentioned some important traits that you always look for. Uh, some of the some of the key features that you have to have in a hound in order to um, hunt it, enjoy it, and definitely reproduce. Can you go through some of those for us? Well, whenever they bark up a tree, it shouldn't be just for making noise. Okay, uh, there should be a coon in that tree. So, you know that going through the motion stuff that 
you know, some guys refer to as action packed or what have you. I'm not, you know, that, that I'll run the other direction. I mean, it's the, the ultimate goal at the end of the, you know, all that is to have a cone in that tree. So when I'm looking for a stink dog, you know, accuracy is usually, you know, priority number one. And if I breed to a stud dog, that's accurate. That's a hard, you know, wide hunting dog that, you know, has a coon whenever he's planted. I'm, I'm interested in seeing more, you know, pedigree, uh, you know, offspring, all the above. And, and in your opinion, what does it take to get a dog that's accurate like that? What are some of the things that have to happen before that dog, uh, you know, he locates and he starts treeing? Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's so many different types of dogs that, you know, that they get the job done today that, you know, a, a lot of people don't realize when they, I guess, see a dog online anymore. It used to be, you know, whenever we see an advertisement in the American Cooner, but, you know, times have changed as far as that goes. But, you know, it's, the ads in the, online, I'm sure, are the same as they are, you know, they used to be in the, you know, the stud dog ads in the magazine is that you, you, the way they describe a dog is you, you really need to hunt with it to see if it's your type of dog. But, um, you know, today, I think a lot of the dogs that are, you know, that are accurate are ones that, you know, bypass any kind of track that they would have to work on to get a coon tree just to, you know, sneak up on one and, and be looking at it practically mm-hmm. when they get treed. I'm, the, you know, the dogs that I've tried to breed through the years would, you know, when you turned them loose, they hunted hard, but they were looking for a coon when you turned them loose and they whatever kind of coon track they come across first, they tried their best to tree it. And that's just the type of dog that I've been breeding for years. And that's what I have here. And, um, you know, sometimes that's, you know, uh, not, not the type of dog that's winning today, but they, they do tree a coon whenever you turn them loose and they hunt hard and wide whenever they need to. But, uh, they, they, they take the tracks as they come to them and, do their very best to locate that right tree. And, you know, that's, that's something that I, I would rather see a young dog develop a little bit slowly on getting treed fast, but, but more importantly, be treed right. Right. Uh, Gary Roberson was on our podcast here, um, recently, and, uh, he's hunting out there in central Texas in the hill country and hunts in West Texas. Some, and, and he made an interesting statement during our podcast. He said, there are a lot of things that have to happen on the ground before that dog ever comes to that tree. So he was talking about tracking abilities and, and the intelligence to, to be able to sort those tracks out in pretty adverse conditions out there. And it sounds like you're you're kind of in that same, that same ballpark there with, with what you're looking for. Yeah, well, when you... You know, you have to, when you're breeding dogs and you like to, you know, you like to coon hunt and you want to hunt what you breed, you have to breed the kind of dog that works well in the, in your terrain right there. And we're in the mountains here. We're in just like a, like a, a medium coon population. You know, you don't shine a light around and see a bunch of coons sitting around, but you know, on a decent you know, two hour hunt around here, you could, you can tree three or four, maybe five coons if they're moving real good. So we got enough coons to tree, but they need to be looking for a coon when you turn them loose and they need to, you know, work up whatever coon they come across. So, you know, that's the kind of dog that I have. Well, Randy, one, go ahead, Steve. You've got a thought. I heard you come on. Yeah. Just a quick comment there. When I went up to Randy's last fall, uh, he uh, took me out to uh, uh, to hunt the, the one night that I had up there when I was picking up my pup, and and he pulled two Grand Night Champion females out of the kennel, and neither one of them had I ever seen or or seen in it really uh, uh, had had not hunted with either one of them, and um, they weren't the dogs that Randy had been winning world hunts and placing in the final fours with. But nonetheless, they were dogs that went hunt. We hunted them individually, and um, I might ask Randy about that a little later on because I I know when I go to hunt with Randy, we usually just hunt one dog or maybe an old dog and a pup. But anyway, I saw dogs that would instantly go hunting, um, no babble, 
get in there, get struck, work the track up quickly, and get treed and have a raccoon. And uh, and I think that's um, uh, that was what I was looking for in a pup. Uh, I'm past the age of uh, cutting one loose and have it fall in there a mile and a tenth, and um, and and for me to have to walk that mile and the while and the mile back. Uh, you know, I appreciate a dog that uh, hunts with me and and so forth. So that was what I was looking for, and that's what made me want to have one of these Lone Pine puppies. So I can just testify, and this is not an advertisement for Randy's kennel, but I can testify that that's the type of dogs that he hunts. And personally, I've always liked a track dog that will tree uh, uh, better than just a tree dog. And, uh, so at any rate, I think that's what you're, uh, that's what you're trying to say, Randy. Yeah. That, I mean, just a, a country dog that, you know, that, that works hard every time you turn them loose. I mean, it's, it's hard not to enjoy the type of dog like that. Well, Randy, I think, I think we've heard, you know, the type of dog and maybe that goes against some of the, the current, uh, philosophy on hounds, but, but, uh, Let's talk about your Lone Pine dogs. I mean, that type of dog has served you very well, and um, you've got one world championship under your belt. So uh, that was 2016, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, 2016, but maybe some of the things that, that are overlooked or, or we don't are kind of hidden in the hidden in the weeds here. How many Hall of Fame inductees do you have in the Trim Walker Hall of Fame? Two. Two. Can you last describe two, those dogs? Years, yeah, Honey Buns was, uh, she was out of my old cowboy dog and a daughter of Lone River Gunner that we already mentioned. And uh, from the first time that Dale and I bred her, she, she was a, a great reproducer right out of the gate. We bred her to to uh, Crow and Gant Grant's cutter the first time she was bred, and it was a litter full of, you know, coon train accurate coon dogs, and and uh, she was bred to, you know, a couple times that it didn't work out, but she was she was on the top reproducers list for the for the better part of her life, and then uh, last this just here in April. Uh, Lone Pine Track Girl was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and uh, she was just about the same way. You know, she was a she had a little more uh, chance at, at uh, national competition than Honey did, but Honey would would have been well deserving of that also. But Girl got in the final four of the UKC World Hunt in uh, 2011, and uh, the year before that, she was she was in the top twenty also. So, and the, she, you know, that's the two that I've had in the Hall of Fame here, and uh, I, I I feel very honored to ha have my peers vote them in. Yeah, we're going to do something a little bit unorthodox here, but uh, I want you to try to put your phone on speaker and see what kind of sound quality we're getting there. Uh, this is a podcast, so okay. this this isn't some type of big radio city radio show. So let's see what kind of uh, uh, sound we get there as you're doing that. But okay, let's. Um, I, that I that's great. Yeah, we'll talk and we'll see if okay. it's if it's not, I'll tell you. So uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So you know, Steve said he wasn't going to advertise for Lone Pine Kennel, but you've got a lot of stuff going for you up there, Randy. And I, I really do want our listeners to know. Um, I know you're going to try to be humble about this, and uh, but just describe uh, how many world how many world championship final fours have you been in? Uh, girl was the first one, then. Uh, um, if I got another call coming in, so if you hear that beeping, that's another snafu. But uh, uh, Biffy Sue got in the final four of the ACHA World Hunt in 2015, and uh, Baby was in the top 16 of that hunt also. Then 
in in sixteen. Uh, let's see. In, si- in sixteen, uh, Sue won the world hunt, and Baby was in the top twenty also. And uh, then in seventeen, uh, Baby was in the final four, and in eighteen, she was in the final four again. And I think in uh, seven two thousand, maybe uh, fourteen. Aileen was a female that I had, and and uh, Rebel, they both got in the top 20 of the UKC World Hunt that year also. And then last and, year, I believe, yeah, I'm sorry, you, I, I thought yeah, you were but, through. Yeah, no, um, let's see, in, uh, in 18, yeah, 2018, we went to the ACHA World Hunt in the spring and shot and baby got into the top 20 in it. And then in the, then, then Rick went to the world hunt, UKC world hunt while Terry and I were fishing in Canada. And then in, in October, we went to the PKC world hunt and shot and baby got into the finals at that hunt too. So uh, baby's been a world finalist six, six times as a, as a four year old. Yeah, so, I mean, I would say that you're probably qualified to talk about breeding hounds. How many How many uh, reproducers, historic reproducers, have come out of your kennel? Uh, Shania was the first one. She, she was the number one the first year that they did the top reproducers list. Uh, she was born here, and then uh, Jim Kress, a friend of mine, um, campaigned and bred her. She was the first one, and then uh, Lone Pine Cowboy was on the list, and then a daughter of his, Honey Buns, was on the list practically her whole life. Mm -hmm. Then, then girl, girl was number one for the past two years, I think, and uh, Lone Pine Quickie was on there with with girl for about a year on the same, you know, top 10 in the country. So I'm trying to, I think that's, that's it for the top reproducers. Oh yeah. That's, that's just it. That's (laughs) 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 yeah. And, and I, I do appreciate your humility, Randy, but I, you know, today it seems like, and I've, I've, I'm no breeder. Uh, I've bred a few litters out of what I felt were exceptional females or an exceptional stud dog and stuff like that and and have gotten lucky a few times with with breeding but it seems like every time somebody every time I would raise a litter of pups somebody would call me and say hey I want a female because I want to breed them um yeah and I I asked him I said well how many litters have you raised how many, you know, what's your basis for wanting to be a breeder? And I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do with their dog. You go do whatever you want with your dog. And and I I think we can have the ability to sort through the chaff on, on some of these litters that are being reproduced. But, man, it seems like everybody wants to be a breeder. And there's a lot of information here that you're giving us. So tell me, tell our listeners, tell me, because I'm trying to learn here too, how does a guy be so successful in breeding hounds? What kind of work do you have to put into into your breeding program to produce that level of hounds consistently? Well, I have line bred and outcrossed and whenever I thought it was proper to do so on different females at different you know times that's that's what we did but the one of the main things is is you 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 know so many people don't really know what the dogs are like in the you know in the in the background of their paperwork so to speak Mm -hmm. and at least on you know the everybody says the bottom side you know on on the female side all the females that i've kept the mothers to them and the grandmothers and then whenever i introduced a, a male dog into the line breeding program like cowboy or cruiser uh I've known what those dogs were like and I knew what their grandmothers are like and their great grandmothers. And I've tried to consistently 
breed the same type of dog so that you're not you know your the the gene pool is is consistent and you can't have weak links in that pedigree and and you know one of the the sorriest ways to go about breeding is to say well i've got a female here that i really uh you know or a male dog that you know if i could just change them in this way or that and i breed to a dog that's you know that's not like that i'll be in good shape and mm-hmm. you, the, the main thing about breeding a female is is that if or you know when you look at the parents of those dogs if you don't say i would be totally satisfied to have dogs in the future that are exactly like those parents you shouldn't breed them that's interesting so you're you're saying nick breeding where I, i've got i've got a I've got a dog that I don't like the way she tracks, but I think I'm going to run down the road here to this great track dog, and then I'm going to get tra- great track dogs. In your experience, that doesn't that hasn't yeah. been successful. No, that's it, that's that's what I call the no plan plan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, if you yeah, I mean that's just. You know, to to get to the short of it, if you're if you're not totally satisfied with, you know, with the male or female that you have, or if you own them both or whatever, you shouldn't breed them. Well, I think it's I think and I know that there's. Go ahead, Randy. You know, dogs dogs are dogs are dogs, and they're not perfect. But you know, if if a dog shows a sign to me right out of the gate that something that I can't live with, you know, they don't have, you know, a good mouth or you know, they say would, you know, and it's not very common today, but a dog that would, you know, pull a tree off of, you know, from pressure or something like that. I mean, it's, I've always been done with them. You know, that's it. You know, they might suit somebody else, but I'm not using them. I'm not hunting them. If, if, you know, I, I tell guys to say, you know, they call and they'll say, well, well, which female would you like a pup out of the most? And I tell them that, you know, I like I like all these dogs for what they are pretty much the same, the females that I have. Mm-hmm. Or they wouldn't be here. I, I wouldn't own them, you know. It, and, you know, I've had guys that used my, uh, you know, my line of dogs to move on with their breeding program. And they would say, is is the, f- the female litter mate that you have as good as the one that I have or that's in my pedigree? And I just tell them, I sold that one. You know, I've kept the ones that I've, I've kept the very best that I could come up with. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's my philosophy short in breeding dogs is that, you know, you need to be satisfied with what they are. And, and, you know, what satisfies one person is, is maybe a totally different dog to somebody else. Right. That's great. That's what makes the world go around. You yeah. Know? And, and it doesn't matter yep. in my opinion, whether you're breeding border collies, bird dogs, or, you know, this is a relevant conversation, whether you're using your hounds to treat bears, lions, or raccoons. You've got a goal in mind that that you're trying to accomplish with your hounds, and you've been successfully, you've been able to successfully uh, breed the type of hound. So that, that's why I'm enjoying this conversation so much. It's, it's not necessarily, uh, uh, like you said, everybody's got different desires for their hounds, but the the basics of, of breeding are the same, whether you want that hound to, to track field mice or you want them to tree raccoons or whatever it is. Do do you, would you agree with that yeah. or? Oh, I agree. Yep. I agree that, you know, that the, the, you know, the weak links are what kills a breeding program. So, you know, not having them in there is you, you're, you know, that's your step forward. I was uh, surprised recently to see a comment on, in social media by a fairly successful guy uh, in the winner's circle at times uh, to say that to breed winners to winners, and that's the key. Uh, I think that flies in the face of what we're talking about here when we talk about building a program over a period of years And uh, I can attest, Randy, to in my conversations with you, uh, in whether we were on the tailgate or in the uh, side by side listening to the dogs, and that um, 
you know, you are are very discriminating when it comes to the type of dog you like. And uh, I think we talked one time about a particular stud dog, and you said, well, you'd like to read to that dog, but you knew there was an issue there with that dog, and therefore you wouldn't do it. Uh, so I think that a lot of people that, as Chris said earlier in this conversation, uh, that just want to breed dogs fail to see that that the success that you've had and other breeders like you have had down through the years has been the fact that you're pretty much uncompromising when it comes to what you uh, let in, so to speak, into your bloodline. And uh, that's an admirable uh, 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 trait for me uh, as a, as I used to breed bear dogs. My father and I bred bear dogs primarily, and we also hunted them on coon. And we had a line breeding program, and we felt the same way. And, you know, I guess the reason that I don't breed dogs anymore is like what my dad told me years ago. He said, Steve, when I get too old to prove my dogs, that's when I'll stop breeding them. And um, and I miss that aspect. I, I do miss breeding dogs and all. But, but thank goodness there's guys like you that are, are out there doing it, in my opinion, or doing it right. Well, I think that uh, a, a lot of people, you know, if they're considering becoming a breeder or whatever, they 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 need to to learn more than what they would learn off of social media. You know, that Amen. If, if you would go and, and you you know you you would you preach. would be an upstart. I'm sorry. No, I said preach it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know that the, there are. There's really um, dedicated guys out there that if a young guy pulled in the driveway and they said, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to I'm wanting to get started here and I want to see what you have and see if that's the kind of dog that I'm wanting to hunt. And uh, if, if, if they if they would do that and they go there, most of those guys would welcome them in with open arms. And those those guys wanting to get into this. If they would say to that guy, "Do you need a young dog hunted, or do you would you like somebody to go hunting with you a couple nights a week?" And I'm not going to bring a dog. I just want to. I want to go with you. I want to see what you have. I want to be involved in this. They would be welcomed in with open arms. The biggest thing today is, I think, through all this social media and everything, is everybody's an overnight professional. Well, and social media. There's a. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say, social media has just turned every. It's given people license. You know, you can develop a page and yeah. and put put what you want on there, and uh, uh, call out the comments that you don't want. And you know, I, I heard another. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but another podcast I was listening to recently. You know, it's made everybody an author. You know the. Yes. And it's been valuable. I mean, we're we're passing information around faster and easier than we ever have in our lives, but Sure. But at the same time, you've got to look at that stuff. I don't know how many times people repost things that don't have anything to do with hounds, but current affairs that aren't even factual, you know? So sure. so I, you you really yeah. got to call through the 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 stuff on social media and back in back in our when we got started the same thing was happening in magazine ads you know uh, sure. but now well, it's just it, everybody can can post right well say for instance if i was if i was a young coon hunter and i was um in mississippi and i was wanting to get started uh steve just did an article not long ago on on wimp Aaron. Mm -hmm. uh, i would be uh, i would be at it, pulling in his driveway and i'd say you know hey you you need somebody to go fetch a dog up for you let's go hunting you know i'll be here you tell me when you want to go and i'll be here there's a lot to be learned from guys that have lived this lived the life of that and i'm sure that he's one of them i've never met him but i'm sure he is so that that's that would be my biggest you know recommendation for somebody that was really serious about wanting to to take this seriously is is to try to learn from somebody that's already been down that road. Yeah, man. I can't re yeah, let me jump in here a second, Chris. I can't resist this one. I saw this just recently. 
a young fella asking about, you know, how to start a puppy. And, uh, and he was asking honest questions. And you, were, you could tell that he was uh, uh, green as grass, as we say, about mm-hmm. training coon dog pups. And so there were suggestions about using cage coon and how to do it and so forth and all of And somebody came back immediately and said, you need to turn that cage coon loose. It probably has kit coon somewhere anyway and leave it alone. Take that pup out and find deer, drive around till you can find deer herds and let that pup run, run, run. And, and just let mm-hmm. him run deer all that he possibly can. And then when he gets tired of that, he'll settle down and look for coons. Now, to me, that's nonsense. But that's yeah. the kind of thing that you get out there in social media today. And I think it speaks to the point that, that Randy's making. Yeah, there's, yeah, a, there's I, no I, doubt. It's, it's, yeah, there's. There's a lot of ideas out there, well, know, but I, I've always pursued this to have fun, not to not to make it aggravation. Right, and and nobody can argue with your success, Randy. Yeah, you know, I'm always amazed by watching, uh, and we're still stuck on this breeding thing because it 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 intrigues me. But you look at border collies from a very young. It just seems like. Um, or bird. I saw a video the other day of a bunch of bird dog puppies, and they were probably nine months old, and they were playing with a wing. And every one of those bird dog puppies instinctively went on point at the same You're time. Talking nine weeks. Yeah. Nine yeah. 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 Okay. Not, right. I'm sorry, nine weeks old, and they're just you know. So I'm not going to drag people. I don't want to drag anybody through the mud here because, like I said, I'm not a breeder, but. How is it that border collies, uh, some of these pointer breeds, and some of these other things are light years ahead of consistency and litters compared to our coon hounds? We're light years ahead from where we were in 1980, but still today we're still not seeing that kind of consistency in some of these other breeds. What's, what do you think about that? Well, I think number one is that uh, – the, the, the guys have probably worked together maybe better to come up with a product like that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, coon hunters, you know, can, you know, are a bird of a different feather a lot of times, you know, to, you know, to put it like that. But I also think that a coon hound has to do so many different things in order for it to be acceptable. Mm-hmm. They have to do so many things. It's not just pointing a bird or, you know, retrieving a bird or being not, you know, being soft mouth that retrieving a bird or whatever. I mean, it's, we're talking hunting, striking, trailing, locating the right tree, treeing, staying treed under pressure, uh, you know, off game to chase. So many things that they have to do right in order for them to make the grade. And that's, I think, I think that's the main problem because in breeding a coon hound, there are so many different types of coon hounds that actually get the job done, but they're not doing it the same way that when you breed dogs that tree coons, but they don't do it the same way, the consistency of the product goes way down. Mm Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? I mean, yeah. if you're breeding, you know, if you're breeding, you know, open trailing, you know, cold nose type of coon dogs, and you don't know the type of dog that you're breeding to, and he, that's not the way he operates, the consistency of the product is going to go way down. So I think that's, I think that's part of the, the problem why, you know, some, so many of the, the crosses fail in coon dogs is that they have to do so many things right in order to be acceptable. Mm-hmm. Well, I would also add that, that, um, I'm just going to editorialize a little bit and maybe get on a soapbox here, but you know, we see so many people that, and there's nothing more satisfying than breeding a litter of pups and seeing them be successful. 
I love it, but I'm also very careful with it. Um, if you just want to, if you just want to go out and 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 breed puppies, go breed labradoodles. You know, go go breed a. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know. You can't fail. You right. Can't, you can't fail on a dog that all they have to do is you know, come and run around in the house and when somebody <laughs> comes to the door, scratch the door all up. You know, that, that's that's an easy thing to do. I, I think it's awesome, this conversation we're having, Randy, because we've talked about mentorship, which is something that, that we as hunters, especially with this competition game, we see more and more people that are hunting by themselves, hunting these dogs alone, because that's what the competition uh, game has driven the hounds in the East to. But you're talking about mentorship where, you know, and how many, I ruined, I ruined so many young dogs that I have no idea what they could have been because I was more interested in having my own dog rather than learning the sport. Or when I had my own dog, then I was getting misinformation out there instead of listening to some of these people that were successful and, and going to them and saying, teach me, teach me how you're successful because guys like you are willing to give information and help people because their success is your success. Yeah. There's when you make that connection with somebody and you know, it's a doable thing out there as long as you're willing to listen and not be the talker all the time that there, there's nothing better than, than the love of a good friend and somebody that really wants to help to see you succeed. There's nothing better on this earth than that. And, you know, there are better things, that, you know, in life than, you know, just worrying about yourself. Right, right. Well, we're going to get off of this heavy topic and, and roll in. I want to know, mm-hmm. I want to know what it's like to win it, win the UKC World Championship or a World Championship, Randy. What, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, when I was a kid, I picked up these magazines I always dreamed about being that guy with the with the UKC World Championship on the cover of Bloodlines or whatever. But you're that guy. You've been there. So so tell me what that that was like to bring that home to Lone Pine Kennel. Well, well, Rick was actually the guy. I mean, Rick Rick won the World Hunt, and uh, we I sat in the truck at the 2016 world hunt and you know leading up to this uh rick was working his way towards leaving being a coal miner and coming to work with me and we had a lot going on and rick hunted sue really really hard and dale did a great job of you know getting sue off into the you know under under off to a good start but rick hunted that dog when he had to get up at 3.30 in the morning, drive an hour to work, work 12 hours in the coal mine. And I don't think many of us know what kind of misery that is until, you know, I, I don't personally. But then he would drive an hour home and hunt that dog. And he had never went to the world hunt before. Mm-hmm. And he just, you know, just went through it just like there was nothing to it, you know. And yeah. he said, all I had to do was just just strike and tree that dog you know that's all i had to do i didn't have to i didn't have to calculate i didn't he said i didn't the whole way going through them unless somebody reminded me of what it was he said i didn't even know what anybody else's score was so he's not your typical competition handler so anyway we we got we got to that point and we were in the final four and it was just hard for me to believe it you know that we were there and we set up on a hill there in, in Greencastle, Indiana, and I don't remember exactly who all was at the trucks and was, you know, backup handlers and co-owners of, you know, and it was a who's who of the final four. I mean, it was, you know, Brian Witted and and Nick Brady and uh, Jordan Westrick. I mean, these, these guys, have, you know, they've been through it. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, Chris, I had – you know, my buddy John Brundage helped hook me up so I could listen to it on my phone or at least get updates on through a text. You know, I'm not too savvy when it comes to modern day electronics. And uh, 
it's hard to describe, you know, as that was clicking down and it was a close cast the whole way through. And from where we were sitting, there was like never a moment when there wasn't dogs running or treeing somewhere and they were scattered all over the place and they hunted the full two hours in one spot right there. Mm-hmm. And when Rick walked up to that truck and I knew that he had won it, I mean, I, I couldn't be out there visiting with them guys when that was going on. It was, it was too much for me. Hmm. It was such an emotional thing to have, you know, a dog there that you've, you know, you own generations after generations behind her and, and, you know, you finally win a world championship. It's, it was too much there to, than to describe really. Well, I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about. And that's the reason why people, you described it. I mean, it wasn't a dog you went out and you bought. You know, you bought last week at the at some other event and then ran it, had an opportunistic chance to 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 win a world championship. You put generations and generations. And, and you know, I was pretty hard on, on people about breeding dogs a minute ago, but that's the ultimate goal, Randy. And I can imagine how emotional yeah. you had to be. Yeah, we... You know, Rick and I were, it was, it was quite the moment for two best friends, you know, for that to happen (laughs) to, you know, really was, it was was great. And then, you know, and then after that happens, you know, for, I mean, I was in the final four with girl in the past and that was such a big deal for me. You know, I'd, I'd just taken her off of, I had her bred the bone collector and just took her off of having pups and. She just went right through it like like there was nothing to it and got into the final four. But after you do that a few times, unfortunately, you know, you get, um, you know, a little callous to what that those first-time feelings were, but I'll never forget it. Well, Steve, you've had more exposure to world champions than anybody I know. Have you ever noticed any common thread or, or any uh, reaction from these guys that you're – that you're awarding world championship trophies to? Chris, I, I have been fortunate to hand a trophy to many, many world champions in, in uh, the different registries. And, and the one thing that you can always uh, see on the face of a world championship winner, it's not a haughty, uh, boastful, uh, better than thou attitude. It really is humility. Hmm. Uh, you can see it in their eyes. They're like, you know, it's almost an emotional moment. And I can almost tear up here as I recall looking into the eyes and shaking the hands of those winners. It's a realization of a lifetime dream. It's an accomplishment that most of them never felt that they could ever do. They always wanted to do it, but that was, you know, that's like winning the lottery, winning the, the, the mega lottery, you know, to a coon hunter to be able to say, I am the world champ. My dog is the world champion. And, you know, I can, I can think of different ones that have been totally speechless, uh, you know, unable to put their feelings into words and, um, it's just, it, it's never, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody stick their chest out and strut back and forth across the stage. Hmm. Uh, it's always been a feeling of gratitude, a feeling of thanking those that made it possible. Um, it really is an humbling experience. I know inside they're jumping up and down and clapping their hands, but outwardly they're they're very, very humble about it, and very almost in the state of disbelief. Did that? Does that describe anything you felt, Randy? Oh, absolutely. You know, to to think whenever I started out uh, coon hunting, and then it graduated into competition hunting, I can remember distinctly looking in the American Cooner and saying, "If I ever just had one Grand Night champion, I'd be happy." <laughs> <laughs> right. So this that's, guy made the fact grand night champions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, that uh, just right. 
that's just how it goes if you're you know i mean i my wife carrie and i started uh i drug a 600 hundred dollar trailer on the side of the hill that her and i lived in whenever we got married <laughs> and we've come a long way baby <laughs> yeah, <but we've, laughs> we, we've 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 worked really hard at everything that we've done and god has blessed us yeah i, Did, I can't even describe it. right and you know that's that's um you said winning the lottery steve but when you see when you see like that winning coach or that winning uh pitcher or something that spent his whole life working for this one thing um probably a little more invested than just taking a chance oh, on a lottery absolutely. ticket and absolutely you know that's 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 the thing it's you, you've got these people out there that um are willing to put in the work and stick to it to be able to accomplish their dreams whether it's winning a world championship or uh, you know, tree and bears or lions or whatever it is. You've developed, you've put the work in, you're successful, you're on top of your game, and it's because of the work that you put in them. And we used this term before, but Bob Knight says uh, it's not the will to win, it's the will to prepare to win. And that's what's so amazing about this story with Randy is generations of successful uh, discipline breeding and culminates – and you. I don't think you're done yet, Randy, but, uh, you know, he's already got one world championship under his belt. So what do you got in store for us, Randy? Are you going to, you got another world champion out there that you're, uh, you're hiding in that kennel that the world hadn't seen yet? Well, I have other world-class dogs. I don't know if they're <laughs> going to win a world championship or not, you know, it, but, uh, I, you know, my, my burning desire to competition hunt has, it hasn't burned out, but I'm, I'm having, I have more fun, you know, seeing Rick or, or these guys go and, and do well than what I do myself. You know, I've, I've felt like I've, I've done, you know, I've done well and I've been really blessed to have, you know, family and support and, and good dogs along the way. And I'm, I'm, where I'm still, you know, my goal is to, to keep pumping out, you know, the best, you know, puppies that I can and, and you know getting them started here and you know just um, that i'm not giving up anytime soon yeah one of the things that this conversation reminds me of is um is in 28 years as a conservation officer one of my duties was to teach hunters education and you t teach the stages of hunter development and the first stage is the limit or the 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 shooting stage you just want to you're amazed at the firearm, you want to shoot, uh, and you just really like shooting, and then you get into limiting out stage where you just, if I can just get my limit of squirrels, and it goes all the way up to the mentoring stage. That's the highest level of development for, for a, uh, a hunter. And I hear the same thing from your story, Randy. You know, you started out, I just want a blue tick hound that I can take out there and hunt. You know, had that feeling of turning that dog loose, and now you're into the stage of you want to help other people and and go for it that way and, and mentor and, and breed those dogs. You know, Chris, as a, an, an older guy, and I'll admit it, it kind of sticks in my throat when I have to say that, but, you know, I've often thought, and I just wish there was a young guy around that has the had the fire for hounds and hunting that I had when I was a kid. See, I was the luckiest kid in the world. I had a dad that was a, a tremendous houndsman. I mean, this guy knew the woods like, uh, you know, the back of his hand. He grew up in the woods. And um, so I never had to, to, to want for a, a decent dog to hunt mm -hmm. or somebody to show me how to do it right. So I was tremendously blessed, but I often thought, you know, I've accumulated some some skills and some knowledge over the years, and I'd love to impart that to a young person. You know, I just wish I had that person. And it's hard to find those guy those kids nowadays. There's so many things. There's so much baggage that goes along with that idea of taking a kid that you don't know 
uh, you know, or doesn't know you or, uh, or whatever, and take them out and coon hunt with them. But when I was at AKC, I, well, I really well, Steve, I'm, to... Steve, I'm going to jump in right there because I'm going to tell you that, that that young person or that kid is out there listening right now. He's listening. Yeah. So you do still well, have that ability to do that, and we all do. If we if we step back and we watch and we see, you know, to get involved and it's not about, you know, being lonely in the woods every night. And, yeah, that's all necessary. But but at some point we've got to step back and realize that we got to pass this on. And, and you're doing that right now by by do, producing this podcast. Well, that's true, Chris. But, you know, really, you know, as we get older, we have stories and we like to tell them. My dad was a great storyteller. But the same thing goes with the, the knowledge and the skills that we've achieved over the years or acquired, I should say, over the years in this sport. We want to share that. The older hunters want to share that knowledge. And it's not a condescending thing of, look, you know, uh, I know everything, you know nothing, do as I do, not, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It's not that at all. Uh, it, it, and I've always, that's been one of the things that I've always wanted to do uh, that maybe I didn't accomplish in my career is to have some kind of, of solid mentoring program so that, uh, that we could, uh, uh, you know, get these, uh, these kids started off on the right foot and it doesn't have to be a kid. It could be a young hunter, right? Uh, someone that's just, you know, maybe he's a married guy and wants to get, uh, get in, into the sport. Yeah. Well, if you guys don't mind, if I, if I jump in here for a second, jump in, I want to mention, I want to mention one thing that how this all took place. Now I, I met Tom Strang in about, 1980, 89, I would say, 1989, and he was in a wheelchair. And I met with Tom, and I started going to his house, and and Tom said, Randy, all I can do is talk to help you. But he said, I'll do everything I can to help you, and we've been partners ever since. We've never had an argument, never, never had something that say, you know, we're, we're going our separate ways. Never mm -hmm. because we love and respect each other. And Tom has been, you know, that, that guy for me, you know, I didn't grow up in a, in a family of coon hunters and I didn't have anybody. And, you know, he, he said, all I can do is talk, but if you'll listen, we can help each other, you know? And yeah. You know, I, I didn't, you know, there was, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't walk alongside each other in the woods, but Tom knew what was going on in there. And, um, you know, we had a, we've had a, a wonderful relationship for a long, long time now. And I, you know, we, we worked together, but I listened to what he had to say and it was, you know, it all comes down to that. Well, I think there's a, a message there in that for sure. You know, what would have happened if Tom wouldn't have been willing to share his knowledge and you hadn't been willing to listen and learn? Yeah, well, Tom has, has, is the toughest guy that you'll ever meet in your life. He, he, his day-to-day -day routine would, wouldn't be anything that I could stand probably for a week. Hmm. That guy is so tough. Yeah. And, uh. You know he he's he, he's just he's just been an amazing mentor to me and uh, you know there's there's people like that out there that are you know that are really willing to help a young guy get going and it's just you know I just see today that you know when they when these guys get started they know everything right out of the get go and it, it it's it's not it's not serving them to to not listen. Amazing. Well, Steve, I think we probably, I don't know how we can do any better than that <laughs> in this podcast. <laughs> you know, that's that's the message that if you want to become extreme performance houndsman, then there's definitely a, a message to be heard in that in that final thought. Have you got, have you got any concluders for us, Steve? Well, 
my takeaway in this conversation and in my time spent with Randy is that he's the real deal, and he is extremely dedicated to breeding the best coonhounds that he can. And he and I've had several conversations, and and uh, in fact, just recently we had a conversation about the type of dog that's winning in the bigger hunts today, and and. Uh, you know, the adjustments that would possibly have to be made to to create that type of dog and do we, does he really want to go down that road? But I know that he's always thinking ahead. I know that he's extremely uh, dedicated to his Lone Pine Tree and Walkers and everything else he does in life. And I just think he's been a great guest for us today. And I've enjoyed this as I always enjoy my time spent with Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, what kind of, you got any concluders for us? Well, I just think that you guys are doing a great thing. Uh, whenever, uh, Steve talked to me about this, I told him about a friend of mine that, that does the same thing on, on, uh, trapping subjects, you know, and it's, I've told Clint so many times that, you know, this, the, the trapping fraternity is gonna, uh, they, they owe him such a great, uh, debt that he has went and found people that have been there and done that and they're willing to do interviews and and it's helped so many people and you guys are right on that that same track it's a it's a great thing that you're doing and i encourage everybody to keep up with it and there's going to be tips and and ideas that will help people so much to you know cut the learning curve and and to enjoy this sport even more and i just think it's a an awesome thing that you're doing and i I really feel honored to that you involved me in it, and I would, in the future, do do anything I can to help you. Well, ma'am, we appreciate that, Randy, and and I'll just finish up here by saying that, you know, we all have opinions on what we like in a hound, or how we need to save hunting, or just we're we're humans and we have opinions, and mm-hmm. I'm not the authority on everything. I'm not, maybe not the authority on anything. I struggle every day, but the best part of hosting this podcast is being able to expose people like you of your character. I know, you know, we've talked off, off the podcast. I know you're dedicated to your family. You're a Christian man, um, and you're a man of high character. And that is the, the, I'm the beneficiary of that knowledge that I get from from getting to know you and being able to share that with other people so i can't thank you enough for coming on randy it's been a great podcast and we will definitely get back on here because i would like to get some more information on on tom and and some of the relationships you've built and how important that is yeah it's i i I have a lot to talk about but it's just been because i've been so blessed and and, you know, and I just I just want to put one thing out there to, you know, there's there's guys that will, you know, that will praise or criticize or whatever, what anybody's talking about, whether it's me or whatever guests, you know, there's 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 detractors, as Steve says. And mm-hmm. but there, there's one thing that that when it comes down to whether I'm, you know, I'm I'm down a little bit or whatever, it's 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 this. The cross has the final word. That's a pretty good concluder right there. Well spoken, Randy. Yeah. Right. Steve, sign us off. It's been a great podcast today, and I'm going to tell you, as I always do, in the words of my old bear hunting buddy, John Harris, in West Virginia, Chris, you follow your hound, and I'll follow mine.